So lab eight is based on orders of reactions. So here we have a, uh, a chemical reaction with, uh, you know, the, like let's say this is H and this is OH. So you've got one H, so a is e little a is equal to one, and little b is equal to one, going to H2O. But that's not always the case. So these little a's and little b's can change depending on your chemical reaction. And for each chemical reaction, there is a sp uh, specific rate, which can only be determined experimentally. Um, and this rate is given by this, uh, this equation right here. You've got some sort of constant, K, uh, and you've got some sort of uh, power for each um, chemical. So, for example, well, I won't go into more details into that. You can, you, hopefully, you guys have covered this in class. But I'll just briefly cover some of the important aspects of it. So the overall order of the reaction is given by the sum of these powers. So if m is 1, if m right here is 1, and n is 2, then our reaction is third order. So you have to determine the total order of it, and that will affect how the, how the reaction uh, goes to completion. So we have... Um, the stoichiometric ratios, but they are totally unconnected from the reaction rates. And they, the reaction rates can only be determined by experiment. And that's really important to keep in mind because you don't want to be getting confused. Um, so just remember this A has nothing to do with this M over here. And this B has nothing to do with this N over here. So how do we determine these, these uh, reaction rates? So you've got a couple of different ways that you can determine them. Um, one is to run two parallel reactions, holding, changing only one variable. So in the first run, we, we run our reaction, and we keep the same concentration of B. So concentration of B is held constant, but the initial concentration of A is varied. And so using that, you can determine how your variable, uh, your A, because that's what we changed, affects your overall reaction rate, and that can help you calculate out what the what the rate law is for that reaction. What we're going to be using is a time versus concentration of reactant graph. And so we're, uh, we're going to assume, you know, so if you've got a, a first order reaction, you're going to get a graph that, you know, A is going to be linear, so it's going to look kind of like this. So if we graphed it, remember the y-axis is concentration and the x-axis is time. So it would be kind of, you know, it would be kind of linear like that. Uh, with a slope of negative Ka and a y-intercept of A sub 0, so that's your initial concentration. Um, so then if we have a second order reaction, you're going to have a graph of 1 over A that will be linear with a, with a slope of Ka, and that will look you know very similar to the one we did above, but instead the, uh, so in this first axis, or in this top reaction, we had this being concentration of A, whereas in this bottom one, what we've got is we've got 1 over the concentration of A. So that makes the reaction, that makes the, the, the reaction make sense in terms of second order, and that will still be linear, but that's because our y-axis has changed, and so you'll have a, this intercept, and you'll have a, this slope, and so on and so forth. So in this, in this uh, lab, we're going to be using this reaction right here. And what I want to, well, the, re, the way we're going to determine if there's any iodine left, so what, essentially we're going to be making pure iodine. We're going to be using HSO3 and IO3 to make I2, and I2 is just pure iodine. And the cool thing about iodine is that you can do, you can mix it with starch, and it makes this dark blue compound. And I've actually loaded up a little video for you. So here's our little video. Um, here's your iodine, and you've got uh, grape juice. There's so there's no starch in grape juice. You've got nuts, so there's no starch in nuts. And then you've got bread, and we all know that bread has a lot of starch. So you notice that the iodine turns dark, a very dark color. So that's essentially how we're going to measure our completion. So once we've got to completion, we're going to get a very dark color. So 
That's and it's going to be called the iodine starch complex molecule, um, and that's just how the lab has named it. So okay, let's. Uh, you guys can look over this stuff a little bit more, um, but it just talks about your initial reaction rates and and you know a little bit more in detail of how to calculate um, some of the things that we'll be doing in lab. So each laboratory group will be need the following. We'll need some of this and some of this and some of this. And so you, you measure out those three and we're gonna then have a, uh, at the very bottom of the lab, yeah, if you scroll to the very bottom, you've got different runs down here that it'll tell you what volume of, uh, of this one compound, what volume of water, and what volume of this compound, and how long it took for that reaction to take place. So let's go back to where we were. Okay, here we are. Um, so these two reactants uh, should not be mixed in any way before we start because that will that might screw up your test a little bit. Um, so you just have to make sure that the stirring rod and beaker in which the reaction takes place must be thoroughly rinsed after each run. Um, and everything will be put into the waste container. So we're going to measure out sodium iodide, iodate, sodium bisulfate, and distilled water. Uh, and like I said, we're going to measure those as, the, as in the table provided at the bottom. And we're going to perform run one three times just because it involves uh, reactants at their highest concentration. So it's going to be kind of hard to get that exact number. Um, and here it just has a little note that if you did run six and you couldn't get the iodine to develop a complex, um, then just essentially put in 120 seconds for that run. So we're going to mix those and we're going to see how much time each took. And from that, we should be able to figure out our reaction rates. And that will be done in your calculations. So. All of that is, is very, very clearly outlined in these calculations, so just you just have to get your data and then you can calculate this out in your final, uh, in, your, in your lab uh, that you turn into me. Okay, so that is lab seven and eight, and remember we're gonna be doing both of those this week, so, and we've only got three labs left, so I hope you guys uh, remember me fondly and remember these lab videos fondly, but Nah, I've got two more, so we'll we'll say well you know, I'll see you guys in class. Alright, bye bye.